Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. So enjoy. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. I'm so delighted to have Todd Mulliken right here with me in the studio. And I'm looking forward to our discussion that we are we have planned. We've spent weeks planning this. Um, we're going to talk today about understanding co-occurring disorders. What does that mean, Bill? It means that it's the intersection of emotional and chemical health. I'm glad that you could join me today. Um, any resemblance to a trained talk show host is purely coincidental. Uh, to- Todd, welcome. Thanks, Bill. Great to see you. <laughs> I did that joke for you. <laughs> so good. I forget. I'll bring you on with you laughing. That's a good way to bring on Todd Mulliken. Oh, you have a great laugh, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you've been told that before, haven't you? I have. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you for uh, for talking about this very difficult subject, this co-occurring disorders. It's scary enough if you have emotional issues, and then you slap on some uh, chemical issues, and you've got double trouble. Oh. Yeah, for uh, a long time, we used to call it having a dual diagnosis where you have um, chemical health issues as well as mental health issues. And then that seemed to kind of get quiet where we didn't deal with it as much. Or, Bill, sometimes in my field, we've made the mistake uh, of, like, I'm in the mental health side of things generally, so I can sometimes be biased and not seeing the importance of sobriety or what is going on with their chemical usage and how that impacts their health and how that impacts their emotional health and, and their overall health. And then I think sometimes, like uh, as a professor, I also work with co-occurring disorders over at Metro State and um, help facilitate cohorts there in the graduate program. And sometimes when I am... When I have my substance use hat on, I sometimes miss the importance of the mental health issues. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? So what we've done the last 10, 20 years or so, in my opinion, in the field is we really have a a much stronger marriage um, with both disciplines. So we're just much more aware of those clients. Like, for example, a stat that I just taught on the other day is that um, with people that have a substance use disorder, there's a 50% chance, not 5, not 10, but 50% chance that they'll have a a comorbid um, ADHD diagnosis. So in other words, there's a lot of similarities with ADHD as well as uh, having... um, uh, substance use issues, 37% for anxiety disorders. So if somebody has an untreated anxiety disorder, uh, there's a 37% likelihood they'll also have a substance use disorder. Mm. And so what happens, for example, people get sober, and that's the treatment, right? We want their, They have a substance abuse problem, they get sober, we're grateful, they're working the steps, they're committed to their faith in the Lord, and the sobriety is, is rolling beautifully, their dependence is on Jesus, but some of those anxious feelings that were quieted, if you will, during their use or abuse of chemicals mm-hmm. is now loud yeah. in their sobriety, so how do we help them manage that and deal with that? Uh, or vice versa, somebody has uh, untreated ADHD, And that's kind of running amok, and the busy brain of ADHD is making them really vulnerable to impulsively use, because one of the dilemmas of ADHD is impulsivity. And and so they have that pleasure center of the brain that they want to use and use and use, and that becomes a problem. So it's just important when you think about people in, in our own stories or people we know, people in our families that may have a vulnerability to a substance use issue, we just want to also be prayerful and mindful about potential mental health issues coming alongside of that. Or if we have somebody in our story that's bad in a mental health problem, how are we aware and just understanding some of the the, the problems that can come from excessive uh, drug use alongside of that? Mm-hmm. Todd, how difficult is it to understand a person's potential mental health issue when you spend so much time around them, it's almost like asking a fish about water and they go, what's water? Mm. You know, because I'm just knowing my loved one to be, you know, super distracted and super hyper and always on their phone. But, you know, 
And we're not thinking of it as a mental health issue. We're thinking of it as just maybe a very distracted person. Yeah. How do we get the right diagnosis or the right understanding so we know how to do this correctly? So well said. Like, for example, one of the things I've seen the last five years in my office, a fair amount, Bill, is people that have, um, let's say it's a 40-year-old in my office, and oh, they're in and we're working with anxiety and um, chemical use issues, and they're, they're navigating that. And then all of a sudden, what's happened in their story is they realize um, that their 10-year-old has now been diagnosed with ADHD. And that's a very genetic condition. And they start to look at themselves and realize, golly, I think one of the reasons I'm really anxious is that my mind has been so frenetically busy and so overwhelmed in the distractibility that you mentioned that I have an anxious condition because I'm operating at a level where I'm spinning what feels like 23 plates when actually I have four or five. Is the busy mind of ADHD developmentally is really hard to manage. So the point to your question is like some people have learned how to manage that and they study three times as hard in, in high school to get through it because mm-hmm. reading comprehension is an issue with ADHD. Some people um, have anger issues because it's untreated because they're just busy and they get very agitated in their adult life if mm-hmm. it isn't treated and... We just know them like that, but their partner, uh, you know, their spouse is enduring that. And so sometimes it goes left unsaid because the familial members are, are enduring that and not wanting to rock the boat or, geez, how do I bring that up in love without feeling like I'm being judgy? Uh, so, you know, each case is so different, Bill, but we just want to have open eyes and walk alongside the folks and, and recognize that sometimes it is an issue that, actually leads to impairment in their life. Mm -hmm. And other times it's an issue that doesn't lead to impairment, Mm -hmm. right? It's on a continuum. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, so for some folks that have that busy mind, let's say of ADHD and, you know, have an occasional drink or two, um, we've known them like that. And it, it seems to be okay. There there isn't an, an overuse going on. It's not impairing their judgment. It doesn't make them, you know, hurtful to their spouse or take things out on their kids or they've managed it. Other people, it's more significant where it's really causing impairment in their story and it's overwhelming. It's just too loud. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's, here's my guest in his own description. My guest is Todd Mulliken. All right. And my guest is a Christian. Okay. <laughs> I love this. This is going to be word association. Yeah. And he works as a counselor uh, and also does mental health work and chemical dependency work and also serves as a elder in my church. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting the answers I'm looking for. Shoot. And is also a professor. I'm a professor. Thank you. And also is an author. Yes. Yes. And if you're a bill payer, your website's still up. <laughs> I didn't know where you're going with that. No, but that, that's true, right? Yes. You pay the bill? <laughs> I do. If, I, if people go to toddmulliken.com, it'll be active. It will be active. and Starting um, effectively and, right now? <laughs> Actually, on my way, in, my, on my way in in the car, I paid the bill. Oh, good. <laughs> that's so smart. <laughs> toddmulliken.com. So I just thought I would uh, let you tell your own story oh, in your own words. I completely missed that. No, that's okay. That's okay. I'll give you a second chance. I just want everyone to know who my guest is mm. and your multifaceted skills and, and talents that God has given you mm. um, as an author and a professor and a um, marriage and family counselor and individual counselor. So um, it's always great having you on. So today we're talking about uh, understanding co-occurring disorders. So maybe you have someone in your life, uh, maybe it's even you, that has um, some not only emotional issues, but you've got some chemical issues as well. And you're going to need to have some talk and some conversation. So let me know. Uh, Send a question over for Todd, 877-933- 2484 again 8779332484 we want to better understand these co-occurring disorders the emotional and chemical health when they they meet cuz Todd I can only say that's got to be so combustible and and complicated and never easy no it the complicates a great word bill and trying to navigate and help them understand kind of the root cause hey what's the reason for the overuse, what's going on spiritually, emotionally, that's making you vulnerable to that. Also, what do you know, you know, what's happening with the emotional dysregulation and you're feeling overwhelmed 
and uh, what's what's at the root of that, and what how can we walk alongside and help you with that, and then also how do we navigate the intersection of those two. So I kind of gave you an example of uh, an ADHD situation and how that can impact and make that person vulnerable to anxiety. Well, how about somebody that is, you know, has a family history of depression, let's say, Bill, and what they have done is uh, they see some of that in them. So life gets hard and overwhelming and they enjoy uh, alcohol and they start to become dependent on it because it quiets the mind a little bit. It gives them a little bit less inhibition. And so things get a little bit lighter. But then very quickly, the alcohol operates like it does as a depressant and really makes makes it a pile on and makes the literal literal hangover even louder and more difficult and makes them vulnerable to actually major depressive disorder. And so now that is so, using your word, complicated and overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But we want to know that both things are at work. So how do we pray for that person and, and give get them help so that both areas are being addressed? Mm-hmm. And that's what we see now, actually. The good news is we're training people in the field to become... Uh, competent in dealing with co-occurring disorders. And that's very helpful. It is. Mm -hmm. Because like even for me, I sometimes get my mental health lens on too much, Bill, as a therapist, and versus reminding myself about what is going on with the chemical use here and how can I help that person if there is. Like we've reframed uh, substance use disorders, Bill. It used to be we have substance use, we have substance abuse, and then we have substance dependence. And usually the substance dependence would be withdrawal symptoms and more of a typical, if you will, the alcoholic. But now we've reframed it, and now we have what's called substance use disorders, mild, moderate, or severe. Mm. So, Give me a sample, if you would. Yeah, so that, there's so like 11 criteria without boring you to death. You're not boring me. Gotcha. I'll let you know when you're boring me. <laughs> you probably will. <laughs> Trust me, I will. <laughs> You don't, you want to I know you back? well enough to tell you, Todd, you're killing ah, me right now. Just, yeah, I'm dying. Yeah. I'm dying right here. Yeah, so is it causing impairment in their life socially? Is it causing impairment in their life emotionally? Is it causing an impairment in their life legally, right? So mm-hmm. there's like 11 criteria, if you yeah. will. What about the home life? If if the spouse is miserable, Correct. I would say, yeah, there's trouble. In Relational River functioning City. issues, big time. Yeah, oh, right? yeah. Yeah, so mild would be is that, you know, you really don't see, it's just kind of there and it's, it's, but it's managed and it isn't causing impairment for themselves or loved ones or uh, in their work life, in their school life, in their relational life, in their, you know, in their uh, friendship world. Um, but more often than not, you see a trajectory where it goes into moderate or severe. And what's happening when it gets in that spot, Bill, is then, um, like, let's say they have seven of those 11, then we see some of the co occurring stuff become even louder. And I think that's, Maybe just a good word real quick is that we've got, um, things are always on a continuum. So I think we just have to really be careful about labeling people, but rather helping them, giving them a sense of understanding of their condition. So that really helps them know, like, God is for them in the healing. Um, a, a diagnosis of a substance use a disorder isn't meant as a label as much as it meant to help them understand they can get help for that. And God can bring healing to that. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So, it cause, does. Because sometimes the labels get quick and and uh, thrown out too fast. <clears throat> and so sometimes we go too far and avoid labels versus like, I would want a label of knowing that my, my left knee is, is, you know, broken and I need, <laughs> I need physical therapy. Mm-hmm. I need, you know, I need help with that. So it's more meant for understanding. Yeah. To me, Todd, it seems that the sobriety component is so critical because that's, that's a fire in the kitchen. And if you're sitting upstairs on the couch going, well, the fire's in the kitchen, so we're fine. Yeah. If you don't deal with that instantly, to me, that is the problem. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not diminishing the mental health component, but if there's n- no sobriety and there's addiction, that's just going to spiral probably worse and worse, I'm guessing. Well, in a perfect world, what you're absolutely right about is when sobriety has been handled or just under, you know, it's been managed at a level. Now we know what we really have with the mental health stuff. Mm-hmm. Does that makes sense. Oh, it makes way sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's some of the dilemma where, um, in it, sometimes substance use professionals can be vulnerable to sobriety only then we're done. The mental health professionals, I can be vulnerable to, yeah, 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 about sobriety, but what about the depression? You know, so, well, let's work on both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's, but let's really help them see the value of sobriety and really make sure that that is a part of the treatment plan. 
Mm. Todd Mullican is my guest. You can learn more about Todd at toddmullican.com. We're going to take a break. If you have a question or comment, please send it over, 877-933-2484. We're talking about the co-occurring um, disorders, the intersection of emotional and chemical health. Let me know if you have a question. We'll be right back. What season of life are you in right now? Season of life. There are lots of ways to answer that question. So what season of life are you in right now? You may feel as if you are in a season of hopeful expectation or a season of desperation. You may feel as if you are in a dry season or a rainy season or maybe a season of abundance. Maybe this is a transitional season for you. What season of life are you in right now? Let me say first that you're not alone in whatever season you are in. And let me also say that God wants to meet you and be with you in that current season, even in that season of wilderness or dryness. And God wants to lead you through that current season to the next one. Discover what God is doing in your life now and where he's leading next at this year's Set Apart Conference for Women. It's March 8 and 9 at the University of Northwestern St. Paul. You can register today at setapartconference.com. That's setapartconference.com. I'm back with counselor, author, professor Todd Mulliken, M U L L. I-K-E-N, and today we're talking about understanding co-occurring disorders, one being emotional and one being chemical. Uh, Put those two together, and that's quite volatile. We're trying to understand uh, and understand it as as co-occurring because sometimes people have a a, a alcohol or chemical use problem, but they're never addressing their mental health issues. So... Now we're back, Todd. (laughs) It's so common. Yeah, and I think the way we see it a lot these days is is the both and, right? So I mentioned 37% of folks that have an anxiety disorder are vulnerable to the chemical issue. And and we think of the main reasons why people overuse uh, substances in general, therefore either for socialization purposes or they're more for coping Right. And so we've noticed that if it is more for coping, there's, there's a little bit more of a vulnerability to overuse and dependence. So the classic situation, Bill, is like <clears throat> somebody has a strong social anxiety disorder where they really struggle with uh, feeling anxious socially. And it, it isn't just a natural introversion that can be treated and understood as a beautiful thing that God has designed in your life. You're, a fabulous introvert that loves quiet and introspection and reflection and aren't interested in talking to a hundred people you don't know right away. Mm-hmm. And that's beautiful. It's fine. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Exactly. So we're talking about like an actual physiological overwhelmed feeling that comes with any kind of socialization. So there's actual social anxiety condition. Mm-hmm. And so they have to deal with society and they start attending establishments and they have a drink or two and they start feeling less inhibited and, you know, ask uh, Susie out on the dance floor and next thing you know, they are more vulnerable to develop that condition. And now they're treating their anxiety, if you will, through overuse. And there's a dependency that builds. And now we've got that going on. And the, the dependency is crippling to that person, to the family. So to your great point earlier, now we treat the sobriety. And so we get them sobered up and mm-hmm. really released from that. <clears throat> and now the anxiety, the panic feelings come rushing back like the wind. Mm-hmm. And, hey, I thought I would be better since I've sobered up. Yeah. And so we just get to do both. We mm-hmm. get to help them regulate the fears and the worries that are coming in and how to reframe that and know that they're enough in Jesus to go to s- situations and be enough and get comfortable in their own skin and regulate that social anxiety. Mm-hmm. Todd Mulliken is my guest. Todd, are there tests to, to determine if you have a chemical imbalance 
Yeah, so t- the typical thing that we do with folks that have a substance use disorder is, or we're wondering about that, is we can give them a, a chemical use assessment, which will be a variety, it'll be a tool that will ask a variety of questions that help us assess where they are at in that substance use disorder continuum. Likewise, we can we have different instruments to hand out for people that have anxiety issues or people that have personality disorder issues, people that have depression issues, people that have bipolarity and or, or ADHD. We're wondering about that. So mm-hmm. the tests really are more self-report in general and that help us determine that. Um, we're, we're seeing some genetic testing that can be available or some, you know, you see a little bit of that coming, but in my opinion, we're still not there yet uh, with looking at how to test, you know, uh, an actual chemical test, if you will, for whether they have depression or not. It's going to be more of a self-report instrument that helps us look at, hey, how many of the 10 symptoms of major depressive disorder are they reporting? And that helps us do good work. It mm-hmm. helps us walk alongside them and get them treated appropriately. And Todd, one of my biggest fears when I hear you discuss this topic, this understanding co-occurring disorders the intersection of emotional and chemical health sounds to me like what's really at risk is not only things that are relational, but things that are spiritual. Mm. Because I see this particular candidate with emotional and chemical issues gravitating away from faith, gravitating Mm. away from uh, God, and being in a very compromised place. Yeah, the older I get, the more I love the word integration. You know, how are we as Christ followers integrating faith into those really hard spaces, right? And when, you know, we turn to other vices to give us that sense of, uh, you know, equilibrium or contentment or whatever, uh, it, it does, it, it draws us away. It moves our dependencies to other places that are unhealthy. Mm-hmm. versus, you know, rooting our dependency and our identity in Christ and having that be our baseline, having that be our root, having that be our strong foundation that helps us manage the what-if thinking of anxiety, that helps us manage the distractibility of ADHD, helps us manage our desire to use in order to feel less anxious. You know, it just needs to be our root, you know, mm-hmm. root base foundation that we draw from. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, Todd... Let's say Mr. and Mrs. B come into your office for counseling, and it's pretty clear that Mr. B is not only using some alcohol and some other chemicals, but has got some mental health issues. What is the first thing you say to this loving couple? Mm. Well, I would ask them each, what are they noticing about this situation? And of course, it would first take the, you know, Ideally, they're coming in and acknowledging that, and okay. ideally, Mr. B is acknowledging that, and that's the first step. And I've always said the, the gold standard, really, in treating folks is is mutual vulnerability. You know, my coming in, acknowledging what I'm struggling with. So, but to your question, and maybe what it can happen is Mrs. B is, you know, hoping Mr. B will acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. And this is where the Mrs. B's of the world have to make sure they're not codependent on their spouse's mood. Yeah, because it seems that the success of this meeting in your office is going to hinge on um, Mr. B being honest. Correct. And vulnerable. And, you know, if he denies that he has any issues... Well, there's, there's, that's going nowhere, I think. Yeah, nowhere fast. Yeah. And so then what we usually find in those situations is that the good news is the Mrs. B's of the world get to be really honest for the first time in their life. But then the Mrs. B might come back next week and said, I'm really, I'm, fr- I'm really frustrated I was honest because it didn't go very well. Oh, no. I can't imagine it did. Right. So I would, I, I offer the Mrs. B's of the world just, just so you know, honesty today prevents problems tomorrow. It caused a big problem today, but. Now we are, now, now we actually, you know, now actually you're doing Romans 12, 9 in the most hardest spaces. Love must be sincere. You love your spouse. You're being honest about your spouse. Um, you're not throwing your spouse under the bus to the counselor, just being honest. So in a perfect world, Mrs. B would say, you know, when this overuse happens, I feel real frightened. I feel afraid of not knowing what to do and I get overwhelmed. Yeah. <clears throat> and so Mrs. B invites Mr. B into that conversation in my office and, and there's some dysregulation, and I try to mediate that and yeah. invite them back. But it's it's challenging. And so a lot of times uh, the lack of um, clarity from the Mr. B 
makes uh, therapy challenging. That's why really, you know, the three keys to healthy or effectiveness of therapy really is involves three things. One is the relationship between the client and their therapist. Does the client feel like they can trust the therapist? Mm -hmm. Is there an alliance there? The second is, does the therapist know what they're doing? In other words, are they competent to treat that condition? Yep. Right. And third is the participation from the client, right? Are they all in mm -hmm. or are they in because their spouse wants them to come or their parent wants them to come or their adult kid wants them to come? Yeah. Does Mrs. B feels like it's her responsibility to try to get him fixed? For sure. Because if she uh, doesn't see him taking a step forward to do a... A 12 step program or an accountability group dealing with his alcohol, there's not going to be a lot of hope to deal with the mental health issues. No. This is complicated, Todd. So much so, and that's why the Mrs. B's of the world oftentimes get their own help, or with the alcohol situation, they might go to, you know, uh, things like Al Anon, sure. where they work on their own uh, honesty, their own integrity, not managing their spouse's program but making sure they're staying honest and clear about their boundaries. And sometimes that gives them a sense of purpose that God can hold them in while they're dealing with something hard. So they're addressing the mess, but they're trying not to manage the mess. Yeah. And that's tricky. And God will hold them together. Correct. That we can say with confidence. Absolutely. And yeah. that's the role that I know I oftentimes forget in my own life is that's the role of the advocate. That's the role of the wise counselor. That's the role of the person, you know, of, of the Holy Spirit that uh, is groaning on our behalf to the Father in all those tough spaces. Yeah. But I just think it's easy to forget about uh, that advocate in our life. It is. Uh, so we're talking today with Todd Mulliken, and, and this is a, a very challenging uh, topic, understanding co-occurring disorders, one being the intersection of emotional and chemical health. If you have a loved one in your life, most likely you know somebody uh, con you're connected to who has got this uh, uh, emotional and chemical problem, and they're occurring at the same time, and you're not certain what to do. So if you have a question for Todd, send it over, 877-933-2484. We'll be right back after a short break. Today I have Todd Mulliken in my studio with me. Todd is a counselor and a professor and an author. And you can learn more about Todd at toddmulliken.com. That's M-U-L-L-I-K-E-N. toddmulliken.com. Today we're talking about understanding co-occurring disorders, the intersection of emotional and chemical health. You know, Todd, maybe it would be helpful if you could give us some real-life illustrations or real-life examples, maybe some stories that help us mm. understand the this co-occurring disorder. Yeah, well, I think maybe expounding on that one I mentioned with somebody battling social anxiety. Okay. And it just not being addressed or being treated. And then they, you know, find that instead of, you know, seeking a counselor for that, uh, they end up finding the counselor being um, the liquor at the establishment that gives them the liquid courage to mm -hmm. and now uh, and let's also say there was a fa there's a family history of alcoholism and let's say this is one of the two and a half children that have the vulnerability to that uh, now we have a big problem because now we have just ignited the genetic markers in that brain uh, with the use of alcohol and a dependence on it. And so now we have both and we have the social anxiety disorder that's generally being treated through excessive use of, of liquor, which is a depressant and it's causing episodic depression and it's causing, um, untreated anxiety to continue. And the, the spouse is uh, uh, dealing with that or, uh, let's say this person single in 25 and living with a couple of roommates and in a graduate school program or whatever, they're, they're seeing this and how do I address that? So that's a very common one. Like I mentioned, believe it or not, Bill, you know, over 35% of people that have 
an untreated anxiety disorder also have a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a really high amount. Very high amount. Yeah. So we see that kind of story a lot. And so what ends up happening there typically is that you usually find actually in those cases that the the substance use issue is a little bit more noticeable. And so if they're going to get help, it usually will be in some type of treatment program, an outpatient treatment program, sometimes an inpatient treatment program. But what happens in those cases if they are just in denial? And you were mentioning a little bit of that with the Mr. B, Mrs. B. Thing, mm-hmm. right? What happens when that person's in denial? And so maybe some of us you know, that are here today listening may have somebody in their life that you're concerned they have an alcohol problem or you're concerned they have an untreated anxiety problem or you're concerned they really are vulnerable and are experiencing both uh, and they're in denial about it. How do we have a discussion about that? Right? How do we do that? I don't know. And so what I always ask people to think about doing is how do I let that person into what I'm experiencing versus taking it out on them? You know, so how do I not put my Pharisee robe on and tell them the 33 things wrong with them and kind of get judgy? But also, how do I not avoid the mess? Right? How do I, as a Christ follower, out of love, share like god when this was when this happened yesterday when i saw you when we were out together i just you know i don't know how to say this well but i just felt i I felt worried because of your overuse but how do you see it so i'm I'm creating an inviting i'm inviting Mm -hmm. I'm, i'm volleying i'm not interrogating now by the time it lands to the person who's in denial they'll view it as an attack right so Mm -hmm. even if there's a defensive reaction to that i would then say, Gal, you know, I wasn't meaning to offend. I was just as a, a, a brother that loves you. This is what I was thinking. And this is what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Todd, how do you tell the truth in love regarding anything without having it feel like it's an attack? Yeah. And ideally what I tell people is please be defined by your intention, not the reaction of the other. And especially, Ooh, like if, especially if you're more of a people pleaser, you're way too defined by how it goes versus the purity of your intent. So, you know, first what we're doing with the Holy Spirit is getting our intent lined up well. Like James says, you know, what are are these quarrels amongst you, brothers and sisters? You know, what is your motive? So if my motive is just like, I'm just worried about my friend who's got a drinking issue and has crippling anxiety and I see that in him, then I'm going to volley it over um, and I'm not going to be defined by how it goes. I'm not going to be dismissive about that. I'm going to be empathetic with how it goes. Like he gets really defensive and guarded I've just seen a lot of people pleasures and shut it down after that. That went poorly. Uh, God wasn't in it. It didn't go well. That was the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I would just gently push back and say it was always the right thing to do because your intent was in a place of love and truth. Now, if I'm the person that's always giving truth out to everybody I know every five minutes, then don't do that. (laughs) <laughs> but if I'm more of that pleaser that is really avoiding messes and really enduring something that's really difficult, it's my time to to start looking at the verses that talk about, like Romans 12, and love must be sincere. You know, I think that's one of the best verses because it talks about sincerity, you know, just being sincere. But, uh, you know, above all things, you know, love remains, right? So it's it's done from a place of love. So the good news is that even if it's received badly, what we can do is clarify what our intention was there and just make sure they know my intention is from a place of love, but is there any way I could have brought that up differently to you or what would have helped? Cause my intent is just from a place of love. And, you know, as we stay regulated and as we stay comforted by the Holy spirit, cause we get to bring this up because we care about that. We would do the same thing. If we heard that they had, you know, uh, they had cancer, we would just, God, I'm really sorry to hear about your condition. And we wouldn't say, I'm really sorry to, that hear that you have this anxiety and a substance abuse problem if they don't recognize they do. But I'm going to let them into what I'm experiencing versus take it out on them. And that's the best I can do, and I get to do that. Mm-hmm. Because now the table is set because it's on the table. I've I've had an honest dialogue. And really that's honestly, Bill, a, a lot of cases I've seen over the decades is like the only time somebody that has a significant problem comes in is when somebody they love <laughs> has mentioned it, right? Like, 
once in a while people come in like, I think I have this issue, right? And then that's amazing and beautiful and wonderful. Mm-hmm. But more often than not, it's, you know, my loved one says I got this issue. I don't know if I do, but I'm here. What do you got? You know, yeah. kind of thing. So just know, like, if, if, if a listener is in that position, uh, know, like, it's not a one-off. It's not like this big pressure cooker. I've got to say it perfect, and now that's it. I mean, I've got one shot at it. Just know, I just, I would not put that kind of pressure on oneself, but just know the Holy Spirit's holding you and being loving and just gentle and going, this is what I saw you last night. I was really worried, and my, my mind was taking me. How about you? What do you think? And even if they get defensive, then just clarify and say, God, it wasn't my intent to offend. I'm for you. I love you. But this is what I was noticing. And that really does land for the other person at some point in their life. Mm-hmm. So it's worth it. Yeah, it's always always worth it. Here's a question, Todd. <clears throat> I suspected a self-diagnosis of ADHD as an adult when I was reading about the subject for continuing education. I could recognize several identifiers in my habits, difficulties, and frustrations. So I studied more and worked on things because I had some understanding now. Finally, I got tested and it revealed ADHD tendencies. I think I did better on the testing due to what I had already learned. Oh, that's so great. Okay. Now, she's also being treated oh, with a drug who I can't I can't pronounce it. How's it? What's it start with? NM. Oh. M- Methylphenamine. Yeah, it's probably Ritalin. It's a generic word for Ritalin, probably. Meth- Methylphenamine. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, way to go. Um, which helps me, um, anyway, some of it's a little confusing, but yeah, there we go. Um, it, she also wonders if you've written on the subject as a counselor and is it uh, being directed to the one with ADHD? Yeah, I haven't written on it, but okay. deal with it a lot. And it's, it's something that's been really, a, a common thing, whether it's, an adolescent, you know, it's the typical one is 16 to 18 years old is realizing they do not want to go to school. They have to reread and reread and reread stuff. And, uh, it's, it's exhausting. They want to do anything but go to school. And it's, it's oftentimes untreated ADHD. And so that all the way to, like I mentioned, a 40 year old coming in because their 10 year old has ADHD and they realize it. So, and now they realize, God, they've really been battling that their whole life. Doesn't mean everybody has ADHD. You know, it's only, it's, it's right now like eight to nine percent of the population of children, four to five percent adults. So that's mm-hmm. still a lot of humans in the world. Yeah. But it's not like every five minutes. So what your listener did beautifully is they looked at it and they, they, they you know, I just love that, per, that your listener's posture. Like, Hey, I just noticed this in myself. And so I was looking at that and did some work on that and, and got some help for that. Mm-hmm. That's like a, template of <laughs> a beauty right yeah. of like how to address stuff in our story and know that you know god can hold us in it and so i just love the humility of their posture there i do too but todd is there also a downside to this approach where mm-hmm. i do all this self-diagnosis and then i come in to you the professional counselor and i tell you what's wrong with me yeah i mean again if they have a humble spirit then they'll be open to like oh, sure. hey here's what Here's what I noticed, and I go, hey, yeah, that makes sense, but actually, you know, as you talk about it more, it might be more this condition, but thanks for your efforts, yeah. you know, right. But if they yeah. come in, like, as a know-it-all, and they're just rereading, they're, but honestly, the person that's doing that and really thinking they have a condition is usually, more often than not, not a know-it-all. Okay. That makes sense. They're, yep. they're usually, the know-it-alls will come in, you know, my spouse has got these 43 issues, and here's what's wrong with them. <laughs> and actually, while I'm here with you, I have two yeah. other people that I know really well that have the same issues. Right. Like, I'm glad I don't have any issues. I'm just kidding. But like, no, I get, yeah, I get where you're going that. It's more of that humility, that yeah. confident humility, I think, is a good posture to have versus kind of a reading Get, going on a podcast or going on a website and going on a Google search and feeling like I've, I've researched this and this is what I know uh, this person I love has, right? And yeah. sometimes we're right, but if I'm doing that, like if I did that with my wife and I think about her worst moment or my worst moment, um, yeah, you know, I might, I might feel like I have that situation. We're not talking about a worst moment. We're talking about a pattern of behavior. Yeah, good point. A friend of mine who's a dermatologist has his coffee mug on his desk that says, my medical degree is smarter than your Google search. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. It's yeah. so good. And I'll, yeah, I, I've been doing this for a long time. And I, uh, the last five years, I've never seen anything like it. Where really? People are, Say more about that. People are just, I think, well-meaning, but really researching something. Isn't that kind of good that they're curious yes. and inquisitive? Yes, the curiosity and, is beautiful. It's like critical this, thinking this skills. listener that's just brilliant to yes. go and do what you did? Critical thinking, right? Yeah, right. But when I am making a case against somebody I love, 
uh, and doing it. It's different if I'm saying, like, I'm really concerned they have this issue. Can we talk about that? And what do we think? I think that, for me, makes more sense. If my posture is like, hey, this is what I know they have because of the three fights we've had and this is who they are, uh, then the first thing I'm doing, if I'm me, is I'm actually looking at my own upbringing first, believe that or not. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at my own story first and going, actually, like, I think my wife is really not, she's not really the issue. It's really my family of origin that I went through of 18 years of this stuff. And now my wife kind of is doing kind of that. So she's got that, but she, <laughs> but she doesn't. Yeah. It's actually my loud trauma mind from my own story that I now am viewing my spouse as having. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that's tricky to unwind out of that because we want to honor that person's perspective and walk with them in it. But we also want to make sure we're not um, continuing that. But look at, I, so in general, Bill, with, unless people really have these conditions that are really, really serious and, and that happens in the world and we need to recognize that and treat those, in general with couples and families, I try to have people make a case for their spouse versus a case against their spouse mm -hmm. in general. All right, Todd, when we come back, I want to ask you a little bit about you know, as we're trying to understand co-occurring disorders in the intersection of emotional and chemical health, I want to ask you a little bit about um, having good boundaries uh, around the holidays. Todd Mulliken is my guest. You can learn more about Todd at his website, toddmulliken.com. Be right back. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. Or you might be more like the person that goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. The good news is, is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a really nice little coffee shop not far from the Eiffel Tower that serves a really nice chocolate biscotti. Hi, this is Bill. I thought this interview was so good, I wanted you to hear it again. So enjoy. I'm back with Todd Mulliken, and we are chatting about co-occurring disorders. I think we're going to try to sh shift a little bit, Todd, if you don't mind, because mm. I only have you for another 10 minutes or so. And before the holidays arrive, once again, this beautiful season of Christmas and New Year's and all the time that you can be with relatives, what are some of the healthy boundaries that we could have and we should uh, anticipate or at least be talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, based on what season of life you're in, maybe just a couple of quick thoughts. One would be is if you are in a season of life as a, uh, you know, a person, you know, as a younger couple and you have a child and you are, you know, feeling like you're going to 23 places over Christmas, just kidding, but, you know, you just feel really busy and then that's just getting to feel like a lot one of the things I have couples do is they get to start developing their own tradition for Christmas, not because they're against their families of origin. They love them, they honor them, but they're also saying, hey, I wonder what kind of works best for us and what are we thinking and how do we talk about that and how would we like to do that based on our church service or the way we serve in our church or just what works best and what we think would be helpful, you know, while taking into consideration our families and their stories. And so... I've seen really good, healthy, like, it brings awareness then, Bill, to, like, that couple and their own dynamic and what they're for with developing a tradition. And then what it also does, unfortunately, sometimes, is if if there is a family of origin amidst the two where one might be a little more rigid and saying, this is the way we always have done it, um, I invite that person, you know, somebody like more like my age, when we have three daughters, you know, we're... Uh, we just, our styles like to have open hands, like, hey, what works for y'all? And let's make it work. You know, what yeah. works for your schedules? And we, you're, you're not, we do it Christmas Eve and you'll be there. You'll be there. Yeah. Correct. And so it's, it's, it's challenging because what ends up happening for a lot of young couples is they're most defined by the most difficult uh, parent in their system. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Because they end up wanting to not get the person that's most like, if you will, like the fifth symptom of narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement and they expect extra favorable treatment and wait for it. They expect automatic compliance to their wishes. So it doesn't mean everybody that is, 
you know, overly, you know, demanding is a narcissist. This means they might have a trait that's like that. Yeah. So how do I, if I'm, if I have uh, adult children who have a family who are trying to figure out their tradition, their tradition, go, hey, here's how we generally do it. Um, but what works for y'all? And you know, let's say you have four kids, and this gets tricky. And so maybe you do say like, hey, here's when we do it. But if you can't come, we totally get it. Let's try another time for you, you guys. Mm. And we're open. You know, it's just more of a. So I think traditions are meant to be fluid, not rigid. Right? They're meant to be embracing versus rigid. Mm-hmm. Because if it's it, otherwise, it doesn't become a tradition. It becomes like you know a ritual that's like rigid and um, toxic versus expressive and honoring and and just what we're for. Is it. So that's one boundary. Sounds like there's a great chance for feelings getting very hurt. Yeah. So you what know, you're, what I you're, appreciate what you're saying, Todd. But yeah. there's grandparents out there going, "Whoa, wait, wait, you're telling me you're not coming on on Christmas Eve with me and my grandkids." Mm-hmm. That's why we're doing this, right? Yeah, and, and you say you're starting a new tradition. Yeah, yeah. That, I can't see that going well, right? So, I probably won't have you back, Todd. <laughs> so then, so then you've got. Um, so then we have uh, four grandparents that you know, where one has it on Christmas Eve, one has it on Christmas Day. Right. The, uh, three of them have them on Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. And so, who are we going to try to honor this year? Yeah, right. So all I'm saying is, as for me at my age, I want to know, like, hey, I, you know, I don't want to be defined by the tradition. I want to be defined by knowing that you know Christ came, and that's what we've waited for since Advent, and He is here, and we're celebrating His birth, and you know, we love doing it this time. So please come if you can. But we understand, you know, and so I'm just saying, I think it's really freeing for the young couples if they know that they've got some choices, mm-hmm. and, they, and they know their parents can't wait to see them. What if the young couple said, all right, Todd, we'll come for brunch on the 27th. You good with that? Uh, if Again, you, you can kind of know, right? Are they being open-handed? Are they saying, no, the only time that works for us is this time for this hour, and that's all you get. Now they're really being, they're being rigid. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. So I'm looking for a, a sense of fairness and, and honoring of each other. Okay, that. I like that. Yeah. So it's, and that's what you can usually tell. You can tell, is there like, if you will, is it is it requests or is it demands? Are we making requests because we get to do this or does it feel demanding? Mm-hmm. Right. And so again, it's not meant to cause issues. It's meant to like, Hey, we want, you know, we're trying to celebrate and create traditions that work and we love these traditions we have. And so we want to get there if we can, but you know, we got two families that have the tradition at the same time and what do we do? Right. We, and so what ends up happening a lot of times is there's a lot of like, um, people pleasing versus like mutual honoring. And when there's mutual honoring, it's really beautiful. Mm. You see like, you know, it's almost like this mutual servitude that's um, very Christ honoring. It's what we found. So that's a lot of what I promote. And, and more often that works well. Uh, when it doesn't work well, to your great point, it's usually because there's a level of rigidity that's, um, you know, not, not healthy. Mm-hmm. What if there is unspoken reasons mm. why we don't want to come because we've done this in the nine years in a row and we can't do year 10 because it's been too hard grandpa's drinking or something's going on that's just not working anymore yeah and that's i have three boundaries that i write about in my most recent book book about being right versus being like the impact of narcissism and codependency on couples and families and in that book the codependency chapter talks about how does the codependent create good boundaries and the first one is honest conversations where mm-hmm. so we would have in year 7 or year 5 or year 4 usually what happens is the person is from that family because it's not that bad and the spouse is going it's that bad yeah and so they, usually the spouse brings it up and says god this is really hard i don't want to see my I don't want to have my kids be exposed to that. I mean, ooh. They're getting know. older and they're yeah, starting they can, to yeah, recognize things. We can't keep and, them in a bubble, but we're also right. not going to say welcome to alcoholism and right. just deal with it, right? So how do we regulate that, manage that? So we have an honest conversation about that, you know, in October, about what's coming up at Christmas, and mm-hmm. try to do it very well, try to make it an invitation, like I said earlier, versus an interrogation, mm. letting them in about where we're at and what we need. And, uh, and that gives that couple then who's, you know, one who isn't, who has an alcohol problem and then their spouse, they have to decide what they want to do with that. And what's the codependent going to do with that? Are they going to address that and say, you know, this has been an issue that I actually have felt the last, you know, 35 years, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's the first step is an honest conversation. Mm-hmm. More often than not, that doesn't work. 
where that that couple is not willing to change the pattern, and this is what we do, and we're really disappointed in you. Um, and then what tends to happen, Bill, that I read about is like a couple of the siblings then might say, why are you doing this to us? You know, mom has dealt with dad's alcoholism for a long time. Why are you doing that to us? You're not coming now because of this issue. You're mm-hmm. ruining our family. So that gets really even more complicated. Yeah. So I try to help people do is go like, hey, we love you. We're for you. But we're just having that honest conversation. Mm-hmm. So, so sometimes the second boundary is more loving detachment. So we go to... We we go there for, but just for a couple of hours because we know a grandpa starts drinking or grandma starts sure. drinking. Yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So we're not, you know, we're being respectful and cordial, but we're just setting a boundary. Yeah, Todd, thank, thank you so much for being here. You Thanks for the discussion. Thank you for the overpriced latte you brought me. Uh, I enjoyed it all. <laughs> Thanks, Phil, for yeah. having me. Appreciate Todd, it. Todd Mulliken, be, you can learn more about him at his website, toddmulliken.com. We will take a short break and be back with more in just a minute. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.